Welcome to A Word Fitly Spoken, a podcast about Jesus, His Word, and our joy in following Him. I'm Amy Spreeman. And I'm Michelle Leslie. And Amy, I am also embarrassed. We need to start Uh-oh. this. Yeah, we need to start <laughs> this episode off with a correction. In our last episode, Womenary, Women in Seminary, we told you about a seminary in the Southern Baptist Convention that had recently graduated a woman with a pastoral yeah. ministry degree. And we talked about some of the degree programs there and whatnot. And all of that information was correct. But I repeatedly said that all of that happened at Southern Seminary when it actually happened at Southeastern. I don't uh, know. Okay. Yeah, I don't know where my brain was. I mean, I knew it was at Southeastern before we recorded. I knew it was at Southeastern after we <laughs> recorded. But for some reason, my brain just didn't kick into gear while we're, we were recording and say Southeastern <laughs> instead of Southern. I mean, in my defense, you know, we have six seminaries in the Southern Baptist Convention and three of them have South in the name. <laughs> so, but anyway, yeah, I, I think that's a totally forgivable, Michelle. Well, thank you. I hope our, our listeners. <laughs> Listeners are as merciful as you are, but that was, you know, that was just totally my mistake, and I, I do apologize uh. for that. But you know, tonight we're we're really going to talk about something that we as Christians and local churches should be really, really careful not to mess up, and that's preventing and addressing abuse in the church. Yeah, Michelle, this is a tough subject. It really is. And the issue of abuse in the church has been back in the spotlight recently, due in large part again to the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, for the past year, in case you're not aware, ladies, uh, the Sexual Abuse Task Force has been looking into how allegations of sexual abuse at Southern Baptist churches were handled by the SBC's executive committee. Now, the task force hired a third-party independent agency called Guidepost Solutions to do the actual investigating and report back their findings and their recommendations. And those findings and recommendations were released uh, back on May 22nd. That's right. But, you know, the thing is, their recommendations are for how to handle abuse at the national level of the SBC. Now, I don't want to get too bogged down in all the details of Southern Baptist polity. For So for our purposes tonight, let's just put it this way. Ideally, biblically, in any church, regardless of denomination, cases of abuse in the local church should never need to be handled at the national level. They should be properly and thoroughly handled at the local church level. Level. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight, preventing abuse in your local church. Exactly. Now, Michelle, in 2019, uh, you and I released an episode on helping abuse victims heal biblically, and that episode was called It's Time for Sound Leaders to Talk About Abuse. And we're going to link that up in the uh, show notes for you tonight. But what we're mostly going to do is to focus in several different ways to prevent abuse, because while it's important to help victims after the fact, it's even better to keep abuse from happening happening in the church in the first place. So why don't we go ahead and get started? What is the very first thing the local church should do to help prevent abuse? You probably are thinking of some things, right? Well, the very first thing is to preach the gospel. Now, that might sound pretty basic, but it's one of the basics we desperately need to get back to. We need to be churches who hammer on the gospel. And there's some elements that, you know, if you don't know, you know, all the elements that go into the gospel, uh, we need to talk about the wretchedness of our sin, the supreme holiness of God, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection, grace, mercy, repentance, and forgiveness, all of those things. Our churches need to preach and teach these things week in and week out. First and foremost, that's just what any biblical church is supposed to do. But second, the vast majority of the perpetrators in these abuse cases are not actually Christians, despite what they may claim or the offices that they might hold. Most of these abusers are either pretending to be Christians or perhaps they're false converts because a lot of churches they've been a part of have really neglected their duty to preach the gospel. Too many churches are teaching this easy believism. Oh, 
you know, just repeat this quick little prayer and boom, you're in. You know, unrepentant sinners often cling to that as a kind of a, quote, get out of hell free card, and they've never found themselves filthy and undone before an unfathomably holy God. Why? Well, because they've never been confronted by that God or that characterization of their sin in the preaching and teaching of their churches. Could some of these perpetrators be genuinely regenerated Christians? Well, it's possible, but uh, unlikely. By and large, truly born-again Christians are not out there abusing others. It's the false converts. And it's just one more reason it's crucial for churches to preach and teach the true biblical gospel. Amy, that's so true. You know, something I've discovered in my years of walking with the Lord is that when you obey God's commands like, preach the gospel, you know, you not only get the the obvious primary benefit of whatever that command is, like in this case, people would get saved. But as you practice obedience to that command, you start seeing this multitude of secondary benefits that you never realized would happen. And in this case, one of those secondary benefits is cutting down on abuse. So that's a that's a really important thing. Well, another way the local church can help curb abuse is by practicing meaningful membership. Some churches have done away with formal membership altogether, unfortunately. You know, it's it's the kind of thing where everybody's welcome, you know, come and go if you want, whenever you want, if you want, no requirements, no covenant, no accountability, you know, all that kind of that kind of thing. That's not biblical, and nor is it how the church has handled membership over the course of church history. Now, I can't speak to how membership works in every church because I've been a good little Southern Baptist girl all my life, but historically, there have been three main ways to join a Southern Baptist church. So hopefully this is at least similar to the way most churches handle membership. So the the ways that you can join a Southern Baptist church are these three. First of all, a, a newly saved person can make a public profession of his faith to the church body, and that person gets baptized into membership as a new Christian. But then if you're already a Christian, another way that you can you can become a member of a church is to transfer your membership from one church to another. And there are two ways to do that. First of all, you can transfer your membership by what's called promise of letter. Uh, and what happens in that process is that your previous church, the church you're coming from, sends a, a letter to the church that you want to transfer to recommending or not recommending that you be accepted for membership. Or the the other way that you can transfer your membership is to join a new church by what we call statement. Joining by statement is when obtaining a letter from your previous church isn't possible. You know, maybe the church's records were destroyed in a fire or the church has disbanded or whatever. So this is sort of a like an honor system, personal testimony that you are a baptized believer and you were a member in good standing at your previous church and, and you're just asking the, I hate to say it this way, but you're kind of asking the church you're coming to to take your word for it. So that's kind of what joining by statement is like. But promise of letter is, in particular is a decent and biblical system that needs to be upheld and adhered to and taken gravely seriously rather than just waving every Tom, Dick, and Harry through the wide open doors of the church. And in the case of new church members and new pastors and new staff members, because New pastors and staff members have to transfer their membership from their old churches, too. And in in those cases, it could help curb abuse if both the sending and receiving churches would look upon it as far more than, you know, just a mere formality. One of the very valid problems that has been brought to light since this whole abuse in the church thing came to light is that sometimes sending churches, you know, the churches the abusers came from, did not inform subsequent churches of the problems with the abuser. If sending churches would respond honestly to inquiries from receiving churches, in other words, the churches the abusers are going to, about their former staff and members, and if receiving churches would ask probing personal questions rather than sending out perfunctory form letters, that would be a good start to making more headway on preventing abuse. And furthermore, meaningful membership makes it harder for people to just anonymously breeze into the church, 
abuse and slip out before anybody realizes what's going on. You know, there are sad to say it, but there are sexual abusers out there who find uh, who find and attend churches with these loosey goosey membership policies for the express purpose of cultivating a pool of victims. They know these churches are just blindly and ignorantly trusting. So they show up for a couple of weeks, talk a good game, and then they start to volunteer to work in the nursery or work with the youth and things like that. If your church has a firm membership policy, you know, you're, you're diligently checking new members out with their former churches. You're requiring them to go through a membership class. You're requiring members to sign a church covenant. Um, you're, you only allow people who have gone through the membership process to serve in any, uh, office or task or role or capacity. You know, not just anybody who wants to or anybody who seems talented. Uh, you, you have this kind of requirement for them to be a member. And then you only let them serve after they have been members for a specified amount of time. Um, you know, something like maybe you, you must have been a faithful member for at least six months to teach or to serve on a committee or whatever. If you do all of those things, you know, you set the bar of church membership high like that. And the abuser looking for a soft target church isn't going to waste his time or chance being caught by attending your church. He's going to move on down the road to a church that's an easy mark. So pastors, I know some of y'all are in fellowship groups with other local pastors, or you're friendly with the pastor of the church down the street. If you think about it, you might want to share these meaningful membership ideas and really all the ideas we're talking about tonight with those fellow pastors so that their churches won't be easy marks either. Yeah, we would not want to see any church be a safe haven for abusers just because, you know, there might be leaders who don't know any better or aren't being more careful. Uh, another way to help prevent abuse that's actually part of a meaningful membership is church discipline. Uh, you know, far too many churches sweep sin under the rug and refuse to biblically exercise church discipline before it's too late and calamity strikes. Church discipline isn't just for the big sins like a a pastor who commits adultery or something like that. Church discipline is for all observable, unrepentant, biblically defined sin. And if we have verifiable knowledge that a brother or sister in our church is sinning, we, you and me, we have the obligation not to make things easy on ourselves by turning a blind eye and avoiding confrontation, but we need to lovingly go to that person and plead with her to repent and walk blamelessly. You know, often, hopefully, that first step in the church discipline process will preclude the need for the remaining two steps of a church discipline. Churches that consistently, lovingly, and biblically practice church discipline help prevent abuse in four different ways. First of all, nobody wakes up one morning and decides to start sexually abusing others. There are always smaller sins leading up to the abuse, obscene comments, dirty jokes, leering, pornography, uh, inappropriate touching in public, and so on. If we would address those smaller sins, and I put those in bunny ears, smaller, quote unquote, sins, because all sin is important to God. God. But when we see these things happening, we might just prevent the potential abuser from continually hardening his heart by getting away with sin and bring the gospel to bear on his life and keep him from becoming an abuser in the first place. He might actually get saved, which would be a great thing. And also, by the way, which is one of the goals of the church discipline process. And then second, if a church cultivates an atmosphere of practicing church discipline, discipline, unrepentant abusers aren't going to hang around very long. They, uh, you know, they're not going to like that. They don't want to get caught. And then third, if if a church ends up having to go through all the steps of church discipline with an unrepentant potential abuser, that last step, bringing this person before the church to remove him from membership, is public. Church members are made aware of the problems with this person so that they can avoid being victimized by him, and the procedure of removing the potential abuser from church membership goes to the church records, right in their uh, public records. 
Uh, and then when he does eventually go to a new church, that receiving church should inquire of the sending church about him, as Michelle just described. So the sending church then can provide the record of his removal so that the receiving church will be aware of the problems uh, with this person. And then fourth, if we practice church discipline on these um, smaller sins with an unrepentant abuser, he is likely to be removed from membership in that church before he gets to the point of actually abusing someone. And another aspect of church discipline is tightening up the roles, uh, you know, your your database, removing those members who are, you know, perhaps they've passed away, they're dead now, they've moved away, they've stopped attending, or uh, perhaps they're no longer members in good standing for other reasons. Now, this, of course, may not prevent someone from abusing, but at least if he does abuse, the media or anybody else in the public eye won't be able to uh, report that he is a member of your church, thus tarnishing your churches and possibly God's good name. Yeah, that's so true, Amy. Church discipline is so important, and unfortunately, so many churches these days just don't even bother trying to practice it anymore. And for for anybody at this point who might be thinking, church discipline, what about calling the cops? You know, yeah. just a little reminder, calling the cops is what you do when a crime has already been committed. We're talking, what we're talking about tonight is steps churches can take to prevent the crime of abuse from happening in the first place. And church discipline of what we would call those quote unquote smaller sins before it reaches the level of abuse is one of those steps of prevention. Yes. And if as you're going through the steps of church discipline with this person and you discover a crime that has been committed, for example, maybe this person hasn't abused anybody yet, but he does admit to having child pornography on his computer, well, that's a crime and you would of course call the police. Well, another way we can help prevent abuse in the church is to take the biblical requirements for leadership seriously. It's not like the Bible doesn't tell us what kind of man, that's right, man, not woman, should be a pastor, elder, or deacon. It's right there in black and white, twice, in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. And yet there are churches who barely give those requirements a glance in favor of supposedly more important qualities they want in a pastor. Does he have at least a master's degree from seminary? Is he a certain age? Does he rub elbows with Christian celebrities? <laughs> Does he have a track record of successful building programs and fundraising and attracting lots of new members? Is he a dynamic speaker with lots of charisma? You know, none of these things are inherently bad unless they take precedence over the biblical qualifications. But when churches are hiring men as pastors, youth directors, and so on, whom they know have been in prison for abuse, as has happened a few times, again, it's not common, but it has happened a few times. And when they do that, we have to think that some other factor is more important to those churches than the biblical requirements. Because someone who has been accused, tried, convicted, and imprisoned by worldly courts for sexual abuse is no longer above reproach. Above reproach, that's the very first requirement in both the First Timothy and the Titus passages. And Titus mentions it twice for emphasis. He's also not respectable. That's another one of the requirements. And he is not well thought of by outsiders, which are, you know, that's another biblical qualification. The very existence of court records and newspaper articles prove that he's not respectable or well thought of by outsiders. You know, it actually boggles the mind that something like this has to be said to professing Christians who are supposedly spiritually mature and biblically knowledgeable enough to be on the pastor search committees for their churches. But I'm going to go ahead and say it. People who have criminal records as sex abusers are permanently disqualified from professional ministry because they no longer meet those biblical requirements. Amen. But some of y'all might be wondering, well, what about forgiveness for repentant sinners? You know, what about a, a sex abuser who gets saved and, and then you know, he's going to need a church too? Absolutely. Okay, absolutely. We've, we've got to take that into account. Personally, I have a loved one who was radically and genuinely saved while he was in prison for mm-hmm. child molestation. 
I know this is difficult for some to believe, but God can and does save sexual abusers. And those forgiven Christians need a church home just like everybody else does. We lovingly welcome into membership re- any repentant sinner, but you know, even these types of repentant sinners who are transparent with the church about their previous sin and who volunteer to be kept accountable. But we do not put them back in the position of pastor, elder, deacon, and so forth. First, because they're d- biblically disqualified. And second, because it is not loving to that person nor to the rest of the church to allow him access to facets of church life that would tempt him back into sin. And if you intentionally put such a person into a tempting s- situation as some sort of way of proving that God has really saved this person, like, like, uh, brother, we're so confident that God has saved you and changed you. And to prove it, we're going to let you chaperone at kids camp. No, uh, uh-uh. that's putting God to the test. And that is strictly forbidden by scripture. We would not make a convicted embezzler the church treasurer, and we should not be putting former sexual abusers in positions that would tempt or allow them to abuse again, even volunteer positions. That doesn't mean we doubt their salvation. We don't doubt the work that God has done in their hearts. That means that we recognize that Satan is cruel and crafty, and we humbly admit that we still succumb to temptation to sin. It's not holding a grudge or unforgiveness. It's exercising biblical wisdom. Following and submitting to the biblical qualifications for church leaders is just one more layer of protection to help guard our churches from the crime of abuse. You know, Michelle, I think you've hit on something there uh, when you said layers of protection. All of these suggestions we're making tonight are in, uh, you know, they're they're good in and of themselves, but all of them together offer our churches, I think, the best protection. And the next suggestion that we want to offer to you is stop being afraid of the earthly ramifications of doing the right thing and the godly thing. In Acts chapter 5, if you recall, Peter and the apostles stood up to the authorities who threatened and imprisoned them for preaching the gospel, and instead they insisted on obeying God's word, and they boldly declared, we must obey God rather than men. They weren't applauded for that by the world or by the religious leaders who were harassing them. Nope, they were beaten, they were threatened, and they took it like men, didn't they? They went away rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name, and they kept moving forward in obedience to God, regardless of the consequences. So life really is way too short to uh, not do the right thing. But how far have we fallen when we won't even address a brother's sin with him because we're afraid of confrontation? Or when a local church covers up a predator's behavior and unleashes him on other churches because we're afraid of a defamation lawsuit or something? Or when we must obey men rather than God because we're more afraid of the earthly consequences than spiritual consequences because we don't trust God to take care of us or his church? When we allow the fear of man to determine our actions instead of the fear of God, we are in grave spiritual error. Should we act wisely? Of course. Should we get good legal advice and make sure we're obeying the law? Should we avoid hurting anyone as far as we're able? Absolutely. But you know when the rubber meets the road of choosing what's right in God's eyes versus what's safe or comfortable in our own eyes? We choose what's right in God's eyes every time, and we need to trust Him with the outcome. The God who parts seas, who cools furnaces, and raises the dead is powerful enough to handle court cases and the retaliation of sinful men. Listen to the encouragement of Psalms and Proverbs. There's, I'm going to read a few verses here. Uh, first, this one comes from Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. And here's one from Psalm 56, verse 11. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Psalm 118, verse 6 says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You sensing a theme here? 
Uh, here's one that uh, you probably memorized, or if you haven't, it's going to be very familiar from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. We must fear and obey God above all else and just let the chips fall where they may. That's right, Amy. That that little theme that we were just hearing in those verses that you were reading, what can man do to me? Right. Well, nothing compared to what God can do to you, right? Our allegiance has to lie with the Lord. We've always got to do what's right and leave the results and the consequences up to Him. Well, we've talked a lot about uh, biblical and ecclesiological ways that we can help prevent abuse in the church. But, you know, we can also exercise practical wisdom, do the practical stuff. God has given us brains, experience, resources, and he promises us wisdom. We would be failing to honor him if we did not make use of all of those blessings in order yes. to protect our churches from predators. So like I said, do the practical stuff, perform criminal background checks on all of your staff members and on anyone who works with children and not just children. We A lot of times we forget some other categories of people that are vulnerable, uh, the disabled, vulnerable adults, you know, do those background checks on everybody, regardless of how well you know them or how trustworthy you think they are. Check references on every single employee from the pastor all the way down to the janitor. Do it thoroughly and diligently, not flippantly. And then you can, you can also put accountability measures in place, such as, oh, I don't know, requiring at least two adults to be present in children's and youth activities and classes at all times. No teen or adult, including the pastor or the youth pastor or any other staff member, should ever be alone with a child on church property or at church functions. Um, you can hold training sessions for the whole church on your church's security measures and how to report suspicious behavior and suspected abuse. Um, specifically address parents on the issue of trusting other adults in the church. You know, we don't want to erode parents' trust in other adults at, at the church. But think about this. Time after time, we hear that children are victimized because parents have left their child alone with a pastor or another Christian adult, just blindly assuming that that person was trustworthy. And I don't mean, you know, to be pejorative there. Maybe it wasn't blindly. Maybe they had a good reason to assume that person was trustworthy. But, you know, teach your parents in your church instead to assume to instead of assuming that every, you know, adult or any adult in particular is trustworthy, teach them instead to assume that any adult, regardless of his title or position, who seeks to be alone with a child or a teenager is untrustworthy. So make sure you have you have your parents having the right perspective there. Something else you can do is to explore the services of biblical organizations and doctrinally sound Christian individuals who can help you make your church a safer place with cameras and safety and security techniques and so on. You can pick the brains of sister churches who have put practical precautions into place for helpful suggestions and resources that they might be able to offer you. In the aftermath of bombshell news of abuse, like we've experienced lately, the most common line of reasoning is, how can we fix this? What can we do? And usually the first place our thoughts turn is to practical solutions. Now, that's not wrong. In fact, it's very, very right. We should make every effort to put pragmatic safeguards in place. But we can't focus on the practical and tangible and leave out the spiritual because abuse is a spiritual issue way before it's a safety issue. And if we get the spiritual issue, um, the spiritual part of it right from the get go, we drastically reduce the chances that we'll have to fall back on practical safety measures. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and a church striving to uphold the highest scriptural standards of holiness will find itself fortified with tons of prevention and cure. 
Yeah, that's right, Michelle. And like you said at the beginning of this episode, if our local churches will act biblically in all of these ways we discussed tonight, uh, there really shouldn't be a need for cases of abuse to be handled at the national level of any denomination, I don't think. And uh, and one thing, too, I, I don't know if you remember a few years ago, Michelle, the the Mike Pence rule or whatever it was, and, and he got hammered for saying that he doesn't appear anywhere with a woman who's not his wife. And a lot of people uh, really made fun of him for that. Uh, but I know of churches who make sure that uh, pastors or other male leaders are never alone in a room with another woman, even if it's a staff member they've known for years. You know, you just don't do that. And you keep the door open. And you, even in in a counseling session, you want to make sure that uh, there's no chance for any temptation to come in because anybody can be uh, a vulnerable person. Uh, you know, when you're with a, a leader, you can you can end up being vulnerable. So uh, just throwing that out there, and uh, we just want to be safe. You know, we want to make sure that we're not tempting anybody, and and we want to make sure that we're preventing any uh, questions about integrity at all. Yes. Well, I think that's going to do it for another episode of A Word Fitly Spoken. And don't forget to check out the show notes for some helpful links we're going to put in there tonight. Be sure to stop by a wordfitlyspoken.life and make use of our resources there, especially if you have a women's event coming up that you need speakers for. Uh, you know, both Michelle and I would love to come and speak at your women's conference, retreat, or other events. So you can just click on the speaking tab at our website. And until next time, let's all work together to prevent abuse in our local churches and walk worthy. 